So our speaker tonight is Melissa Price. She's an underwater archaeologist and diving safety officer at the Florida Bureau of Archaeological Research. She's also a PhD candidate and affiliated fellow at Leiden University in the Netherlands. Her current work focuses on submerged pre-contact sites in the Gulf of Mexico. So thank you, Melissa, for joining us. Let me stop sharing my screen and let you take it away. Cool, then I will share my screen and drive the bus here. Okay. Can everybody see that? Yep. All right, great. Okay. Well, thank you, Jamie, for that introduction and for the opportunity to talk with you all today. As Jamie mentioned, I am an archaeologist for the Florida Bureau of Archaeological Research, but I'm coming at you today in my PhD candidate capacity and specifically talking about how I examined marine transgression of an archaeological site located in the Gulf of Mexico. Just to give you a brief overview, I'm going to introduce a short background about the subject site of my dissertation, highlighting the work that my office has completed under Dr. Ryan Duggins, the principal investigator of Minnesota Key Offshore, which I'm just going to call MKO for the rest of this talk. Next, I will go into my PhD research concerning oysters, my methodology for assessing my research questions, the results, and then some significant findings. So... Depending on where in the world you're watching from, let's transport ourselves to the southwest coast of Florida in the Gulf of Mexico off of Sarasota County, which you can see here, and specifically 335 meters off of Minnesota Key, which is a barrier island. And let's go also to 6.7 meters underwater or 22 feet underwater. The Minnesota Key offshore site was reported to the Florida Bureau of Archaeological Research, which I'm just going to call BAR from here on out in 2016 by a diver searching for fossilized shark's teeth, which you can see an example on your screen here. And that diver ended up finding a human mandible or jawbone. Because the site was in Florida state waters and potentially involved human remains, the Division of Historical Resources had to step in according to our state statutes. Staff from BAR were led by Dr. Duggins on a site visit, whereby upon diving, they noted peat cropping up out of the marine sand. So peat is a dense organic layer that we often find at the base of lakes or other saturated, highly organic environments, so it was a bit unexpected at the time. Even more unexpected were um, human remains that were embedded in this peat, along with modified wooden stakes that were cropping up out of the peat as well, and visible below just a few inches of modern marine sand. After preliminary investigations, BAR realized this location was likely the site of an archaic period mortuary pond. So in Florida, there's a unique cultural practice in which people interred their deceased into saturated peat environments. Most of what we know stems from a limited number of sites, which you can see here on your screen, and they're spread throughout Florida. Um, they're often re referred to as mortuary ponds or burial ponds or charnel ponds. Windover was the most thoroughly documented and is the source for much of what we know about these sites in Florida. They typically date between 10,000 to 7,000 years old, but none occur more recently than 5,800 years ago. At these sites, as you can see in this uh, artist rendition over here, which is based off of Windover, people were placed in shallowly excavated pockets in saturated peat and then modified wooden stakes. You can see those examples here. Uh, were placed around the, the burials, perhaps to visually mark them or keep the people in place. BAR has protected, managed, and researched MKO since 2016 under the direction of Dr. Duggins. In order to understand the extent of the site, staff conducted thorough remote sensing. This included the use of side scan sonar, sector scanning sonar, which you can see an example here, sub-bottom profiling, which I have an example here, and some other different types of um, remote sensing equipment. In this bird's eye view of the site, you can see the peat ledge outcropping that juts out of the rippled marine sand. You've also got some scuba divers visible here, as well as further offshore, some live rock or pockets of reef. Um, and then also this parametric sub-bottom profiler data shows a side view of the pond, which uh, gives us an idea of the extent of the, the buried deposit. So we have the top-down view and the side view. Investigations at the site also included repeated surveys on scuba to document the extent of displaced material. It is actively eroding out of the seafloor, 
So early work certainly took place in a rescue archaeology context. Um, this area was popular for fossil hunting, as I mentioned before, with the um, shark's teeth. So BAR wanted to ensure that human remains were not inadvertently disturbed or um, taken home. More in-depth investigations at the site included collection of 28 sediment cores. You can see examples here, which would provide a window into the depositional environment over time. And then finally, four one meter by one meter units were excavated. None of them targeted areas with visible cultural material, but burials were eventually located. All of this work was completed with the help of numerous outside agencies, universities, and volunteers. So I just wanted to highlight that. The information contained in this site plan is the culmination of my office's years of work at the site since 2016. I show you this because throughout my talk, I'm gonna refer to different units um, and areas around, around the site. So I want you to be aware of that. So this line here, if I go back, kind of matches this peat outcrop here that's sticking proud of the seafloor. So that's what you're seeing there. Um, we've also got the um, 2017 unit that we excavated right here, and then the three 2018 units that we excavated here. So if I say periphery of the site, this is what I'm talking about. If I say interior, this is what I'm talking about. This is the known extent of the peat um, that we saw either below a few inches of sand or saw in our units or um, saw in the sediment cores. These cores with the circles also had peat in them, so that gives you an idea of how much farther this site likely extends. I do want to highlight this is area one here. This was not a formal unit, but there was um, this was one of the earliest areas that we saw that was eroding out of the seafloor, so I will mention this um, a little bit later. To summarize years of BAR's work, MKO is another example of a mortuary pond that was used as a place of interment by a community during the Middle Archaic period. Modified wooden stakes, which you can see up here in situ and then after they've been collected, uh, date between about 7,400 to 7,000 years ago. So when the site was used at that time, sea levels were much lower than they are today. You can see in this stylized image how um, the shape and size of Florida has changed remarkably over time, essentially drowning the landscape and MKO along with it. So once what was once originally uh, an inland freshwater pond is now in an offshore oceanic context. So that's my little intro. So how does this relate to oysters? In 2016, area one, that um, area that I pointed out that wasn't a formal unit, revealed oyster shells in direct association with human crania and wooden stakes. It was originally hypothesized that these oyster shells could have been deliberately placed funerary objects because they seem to be surrounding a cranium. But I must note here that I'm not going to show any in situ depictions of this instance, nor will human remains be shown during this presentation. After that initial instance in 2016, I was photographing those oysters and came upon one with skeletal material still embedded in it. You can kind of see the shape, um, this gray shape here. This was the first indication that these oysters were not actually funerary objects. Instead, they came after the burials and indicated a change in the pond environment. In order to understand how significant this is, I'm gonna talk very quickly about oyster biology and habitat. That an oyster was attached to archaic period skeletal material is surprising because they need access to the water column in order to breathe and filter feed. If they become buried, they will die due to smothering. Furthermore, once young oysters choose a surface to settle on, um, they cement themselves to it and they never move again. So I have examples here of oysters on mangrove roots. They're most commonly found in brackish, estuarine, or near coastal regions with ideal salinity somewhere between 14 and 28. After additional, additional excavations in 2018, BAR found another example of skeletal material with an oyster still attached to it. So the skeletal material would have been right here. Um, it was still in the life position, which means both of its valves were still attached at the hinge, hinge, so an upper valve here, and then the lower valve, and there was also a barnacle within this uh, oyster. There were also many instances of barnacles that were attached to wooden stakes and skeletal material, and other oyster shells had attachment scars that looked like they could fit around modified wooden stakes, so these areas here are the attachment scars. In the interior portion of the site, those three um, 2018 units that I showed you earlier, these oysters were under about 25 centimeters of sediment. 
So that meant this wasn't a recent phenomenon. They didn't grow like, you know, two years ago. So that's um, pretty fascinating. So we can glean from this oyster evidence alone that the thousands year old skeleton material was exposed long enough for an oyster to settle upon it, cement itself to the surface, and then grow for a period of time. We know that when this happened, the water must have been saline enough to support oysters and barnacles. And so based on these oysters alone, there's a remarkable story, but also some nagging questions. When were they introduced to this once freshwater pond? How old are they? Meaning how long did they grow on exposed human remains? And were they all introduced at the same time and in the same environment? So this is where my PhD research comes in, which sought to answer the following question. What can an examination of oysters excavated from MKO reveal about the paleo environment, site exposure, and site formation processes during marine transgression? And to go a little bit further, does this study provide insight into the circumstances that allowed the pond and the human remains within it to be preserved? If we imagine the life of the pond looking something like this, then I'm interested in this phase right here. There's a unique opportunity to study past sea level rise thousands of years ago at this site via the oysters that were attached to human remains. But before I get into the methods, um, I do want to have a disclaimer here that my research did not include any material that fell under the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act. Human remains and associated funerary objects that originated from this site were repatriated to the federally recognized tribal nations in Florida and reburied in a secure location under tribal direction. So the oysters that I studied were not deemed to be of NAGPRA significance. To answer my research questions, I chose four analytical tools, including morphometric analysis to assess past oyster habitat, stable carbon and oxygen isotope analysis to evaluate the paleo environment, and that is a tool within sclerochronology to understand the life of the oyster, and finally, radiocarbon dating to establish a timeline. And I'll talk about each of these in turn, but just to give you a little bit of an overview of the various parts of the oyster valve that I'm going to be talking about, um, we have the attachment scar, which is the also referred to as the lower or left valve. This is the one that sticks to the substrate that cements to the object. Um, that's on the exterior portion of the valve. If you flip it over, you've got the interior portion, got the hinge down here. And if you zoom in on the hinge, you can see that the direction of growth is this way as the shell deposits new layers. So just kind of keep those parts in mind as we move through the slides. I started with the simplest method of morphometric analysis, which looks at the ratio of the height. So that's the longest uh, measurement to the length of an oyster valve, specifically the one that attaches to the substrate. So the left or lower valve. Studies suggest that information about the habitat can be gleaned from an analysis of the shell shape. The ratios are broken down as such. If it's less than 1.3, then it represents a sand oyster. If it's between 1.3 to 2.0, um, it's a bed oyster classification. And then if it's greater than two, it's a reef oyster classification. And each of those is associated with a particular type of habitat, which I've summarized here for you. I had 22 shells from MKO that were preserved enough for this type of analysis. That's not really a large sample set, but that's what I had to work with, you know, from an archaeological site. And I wanted to compare those oysters to two different modern sample sets. Um, I chose one from, so if this is the site here, one from north of the site from pilings at the dock where we were keeping our boats. And then the second modern sample I chose is way down here. It's on the back side of the barrier island. So I call them Lemon Bay because that's the um, estuary. Um, and I chose those because they were growing on mangrove roots. And I figured mangrove roots would mimic the shape of MKO oysters growing on human remains, essentially, and wooden stakes. The results of my statistical analysis show how the MKO oysters plot compared to the two modern sample sets. So we have the MKO oysters that grow on the stakes, we have the Nokomis boat ramp piling oysters, and then the Lemon Bay estuary mangrove root oysters. And you can see um, the different types of attachment scars over here and how they compare. Um, the means are all within this bed oyster classification, um, which we would expect for the MKO oysters, certainly, and the LB oysters. But these piling oysters, I think the sample set was just too small because they're stretching into the reef oyster classification, which is what I would have expected. So again, this is um, a bit of an oversimplified measurement for a highly variable organism. 
But regardless, for the MKO oysters, this analysis suggests that the oysters were indeed growing singly or in loose clusters, uh, which is what we would expect for these stakes. So because morphometrics is a basic analytical tool, in my case, I'm going to focus much of the rest of this time on stable isotope analysis instead. But I don't want to get too far into the weeds um, here. But basically, isotopes are present everywhere, and they're incorporated into body tissues through consumed food and water. And in my case, when oysters create new layers of shell. For my study, I looked at stable carbon and oxygen isotopes. The oxygen isotopic ratios in oyster shells are in or near isotopic equilibrium with the surrounding water. Isotopic ratios in mollusk shells are influenced by temperature and the oxygen isotopic composition of local water. So that's for the, the oxygen ratios. And this in turn is influenced by fresh and saltwater mixing and evaporation. The carbon exists naturally in the environment in several forms, and the ratio of this isotope varies according to different environmental factors. In mollusk shells, carbon isotope ratios are influenced by the oyster's diet, metabolic rate, isotopic composition of the dissolved inorganic carbonate, and that's dependent on several related environmental variables. So that's a lot. But basically, oysters take up and incorporate these isotopes into their shells when they make the new layers as they deposit these new layers. Therefore, sequential sampling over the life of the oyster will reveal systematic variation of oxygen and carbon isotopes. And um, these are expressed, these are the ratios that I'm looking at, and then they're expressed as delta O18. So when you hear that, just think oxygen, and then delta C13, um, that's carbon. If you're not into isotopes, that's a lot of confusing information, and I know I've got a broad group here, so let me just boil it down at the risk of oversimplifying. Um, the oyster is recording changes in the surrounding water, so this is visible in the delta O18 and the delta C13. So, for example, higher temperatures, increases in freshwater influx, um, or precipitation, they can cause more negative delta O18 values, and the opposite is true for, um, you know, colder temperatures, more evaporation, and then Delta C13 values are a bit more complicated to interpret, but importantly for this study, I'll just mention decreases in salinity are associated with decreases in delta C13, and then increases in decomposition of organic matter uh, contributes to a decrease in delta C13 in um, oysters. Okay, so to examine stable isotopes in the oysters, I chose eight valves from MKO, focusing on those that were attached to skeletal material or closely associated with skeletal material or those with attachment scars that were highly suggested of modified wooden stakes or um, skeletal material. Sampling was conducted at the Alabama Stable Isotope Laboratory with the help of Dr. Fred Andrews. So a big thank you to him. I believe he's here. Um, the area I needed to sample was inside of the hinge. So Dr. Andrews uh, removed the ventral shell, embedded the rest in epoxy, and then bisected it. And when you open it up, you can see the, the area where I need to sample. And then a thin section was created and mounted on a slide for me to actually be able to sample. I loaded each slide into a micro mill and used software to place milling pathways based on the internal structures of the shell. As oysters deposit new layers, they're recording those changes in the surrounding water. So by sampling as much of the shell as possible, I could examine water parameters over the life of the oyster. So um, I just want to point out, this is the most recent growth margin here. So I started with my transect lines and moved this way. So this is the oldest part of the oyster. So for each oyster, I collected a number of powdered calcite samples. Um, this shell, for example, had 30 individual samples, but some had like up to 70. So that's a lot of data per, per shell. As I said, I went through this process for eight uh, MKO oysters. That's what you see here. And then for two modern oysters from the back of that barrier island that I pointed out before, the Lemon Bay. And then I also uh, sampled some barnacles from Minnesota Key offshore uh, that were attached to skeletal material or wooden stakes. Basically, I wanted to see if the barnacles were forming at the same time as the oysters based on the environment, you know, the water parameters. And then finally, I sampled a few freshwater snails, that's the gastropods here, that originated from the peat layer that contained skeletal material. So this would provide a baseline for freshwater conditions at the pond prior to the introduction of the oysters. And this is an example of a modern oyster there. The raw data shows the sample ID, which is here, um, how far from the most recent growth margin, again, that's here, that the sample was collected, and then um, the corresponding measurements of the delta O18 and delta C13. So again, there's two measurements for each powdered sample. 
And when I've plotted all of that, um, this is a cross plot of each of those two measurements for every single uh, sample that I collected. So I get something that looks like this. You have the delta O18 on the y-axis, the delta C13 on the x-axis, and then we can see all eight MKO oysters and all that data plotted here, and then the two modern um, Lemon Bay or LB oysters cross plotted as well. Already we can see that the two modern oysters plot differently to the eight MKO oysters. Uh, the modern oysters just have more negative carbon values, and then some of these MKO oysters are trending more positively in terms of the oxygen values. I'm going to boil all that information down to just the mean value for each shell. So here we have the mean delta C13 value for the entire shell. Again, the two modern shells and then those eight MKO shells. And it's clear here that the modern oysters are distinct from those MKO oysters based on carbon. And then we also have the mean oxygen for each shell also shows some interesting pattern. Some of these MKO oysters are plotting closer to the modern oysters in terms of oxygen than some of these other MKO oysters, which is interesting. So this was my first indication that maybe the MKO oysters may have been capturing uh, changes in the water in the pond over time, which I'm gonna get into um, in more detail later. So how does the oyster information compare to the barnacles and freshwater snails? We'd expect the snails to exhibit more negative delta O18 values that would reflect the fresher water parameters of the original pond environment. And we can kind of see that here. We've got the mean delta O18 for the gastropods down here. And then you can see the modern, sorry, the archaic uh, MKO oysters here, and then the barnacles, and then as well as those modern oysters. Um, I looked at, again, a few barnacles because I was curious to see if they were growing in similar environments to the oysters, and they do seem to be tracking with the oysters based on this information. And then in looking at the mean delta C13 for the material, again, we notice that the modern oysters are way out here on their own. Um, what's going on with this? Well, just briefly, the wildly negative values are most likely due to the Seuss effect. Basically, we humans have modified the natural environment so much that it is affecting the carbon um, in these oysters. I think that's the biggest issue of what's going on here. Obviously, this is um, a little bit more complicated, but pollution runoff and burning of fossil fuels contributes to these lower delta C13 values in these modern um, oysters. To better illustrate the varying environments, um, let's look again at a cross plot of just the mean value for every single organism that I sampled. So just like before, the delta O18 is on this y-axis here, and then um, the delta C13 is on this x-axis down here. Again, we can see the gastropods are capturing one environment. We have the modern oysters over here, and then we have the collection of MKO uh, oysters and barnacles up here. And there are some interesting clusters up in this data here. But before I get into that, I'm then now going to talk about um, other aspects of sclerochronology. So this is the study of physical and chemical variations in annual growth rings in these oysters. I kind of already went through the chemical variations, um, but I used this approach to estimate growth rate, age of the oyster, and then during what season the oyster died. So you may have noticed in earlier photos that um, there are alternating gray and white growth bands in these bisected portions. So for oysters in Southwest Florida, gray bands are typically deposited in, in colder seasons, and then the white bands are deposited in warmer seasons. Theoretically, you can count pairs of bands to estimate the age of each oyster. In practice, this is a bit more complicated um, because oysters can deposit gray bands for a variety of reasons, including heat stress, um, freshwater flooding, spawning, and others. So to figure out which gray bands are truly deposited in colder months, we can overlay that isotope data. Um, and here you can see this, is, this would be the delta O18 and then the delta C13 overlaid um, if we started here at the most recent growth margin and moved this way. So now we can more clearly visualize the true gray bands. So the colder it is, the more positive the uh, delta O18. And then you can also see false bands, which may be due to uh, freshwater um, flooding or heat stress. I will note that these oysters were plagued by a variety of parasites, including mudworms, which burrow into and live within the shell. And you can see a burrow here. Uh, so this this is basically a lack of data. This is just missing because of these burrowing organisms. So that's just what I had to deal with. 
So what happens if an oyster does not exhibit internal banding? Well, this is an unusual occurrence, as fate would have it. I encountered this with my MKO oysters, of course. Nothing can be easy. And of course, the lack of banding existed in the only two oysters that were directly attached to skeletal material at the time of recovery. So you can see how these um, were affected by mudworms quite severely with these large gaps in the shell. Um, this made it really difficult to sample. Um, I had to drill holes instead of transect lines like you saw in earlier slides. And I was kind of uh, navigating blind without the gray or white growth bands to guide sampling placement. So a little bit of um, lower sampling resolution, unfortunately, which is visible in the plotted profiles. So it's a bit harder to distinguish warmer versus colder periods without the guidance of those alternating bands. Um, we have, again, missing data because there are parts of the hinge are missing. And it's also harder to guess how old these oysters are based on delta 18 extreme values. But you know, I, I still did my best, and I'll show you a summary of the ages later. Um, but you know, this makes interpretations weaker for these specimens, unfortunately. Another aspect um, and purpose of sclerochronology is to determine season of death. One way of doing this is to look at the most recent growth band, which you can see up here in Southwest West Florida. Again, if it's a white growth band, it likely died in the warmer months. And if it's gray, it likely died in the colder months. But again, complications arise if there are no visible bands or if the most recent band happens to be one of those false gray bands that I mentioned earlier. So for example, these two modern oysters were collected in July meaning that they died in the summer months, especially in Florida. Uh, one of them shows the expected white band up here, um, but the other shows a gray band. So in this case, we can look at the stable isotope analysis plotted over the profiles for our season of death interpretations. Again, the more negative the delta O18, um, that's the dots, the um, more likely it is that it died in the summer months. So you can see that it was trending, the data was trending downward. So these both died likely in the summer, which is true because I collected them in July. To make these trends even more obvious, I uh, divided the profiles of the Delta O18, so the oxygen only, uh, into thirds. So this technique is based off of other studies. Each oyster is unique and oysters are highly variable. So this was one way of kind of estimating season of death. Again, it's not perfect, but if a most recent sample, which is on this side, um, falls into the lower third of the divided profile, then the oyster likely died in the winter. If the sample falls in the uh, upper, sorry, lower third is summer, upper third is winter. And then if it died in the middle third, it was either in the fall or spring, depending on how the data is trending. So if it's going upwards, then it died in the fall. Downwards, then it died in the spring because it's heading towards summer. Caution, though, is warranted with this method. Short-lived oysters may not record a full range of delta O18, resulting in a divided profile that does not accurately represent a full year. Those mudworm voids in the shell uh, could affect some of these estimates as well. Missing shell structure and data can diminish the overall profile amplitude. And then finally, while temperature is the dominant controller uh, factor controlling delta O18, salinity extremes can cause dips in the values thus causing incorrectly assigned seasons of death. So it's not a perfect mechanism, it's a rough guideline. But to summarize, um, here are the ages and seasons of death for the oysters based on a combination of isotopic and sclerochronological results. We can now see that the oysters are between one and three years old at the time of death, which remarkably suggests human remains and wooden stakes were exposed for just as long. I know this is a lot of information, let me review the radiocarbon results, and I promise I'll pull this all together into a story about marine transgression that makes sense. Not only did I radiocarbon date all the material that I examined via stable isotope analysis, I also dated peat sediment samples and faunal bone from the original freshwater pond environment wood samples and sediment samples from the transgressive stratum. So at the bottom here, we've got peat um, showing the deep time of the pond as well as freshwater species. Um, I targeted snake and turtle. And then these three dates here capture the cultural use of the pond. This is peat and wood samples from um, the peat layer, the peat layer that was containing the cultural material. So, and then you can see the oysters and barnacles here. They appear to date older than the cultural use of the pond, but this is a false appearance. Oysters typically um, appear to date older than they are due to the marine reservoir effect, and 
the hard water effect, for example, basically water is coming up through old, old limestone in Florida, um, feeding this pond and then making these oysters appear older than they actually are. This is something we run into when we date oysters, but it's still um, typical to date anything that you're trying to use for um, rebuilding the paleo environment. But regardless, there is a fascinating pattern in these results. We can see that there are two distinct groups in the radiocarbon results. We have an earlier instance, even if we can't trust that actual date, um, and then a later instance. So this is a wonderful indication that there were two time periods in which oysters were introduced and thus forming in this pond. So have we captured two separate marine transgressive instances? I think so. This is even more fascinating when we compare these dates with what we know about isotope analysis. So um, the earlier dated oysters that I showed you um, down here correspond with uh, fresher water parameters at the time of growth. Um, so now we can see how this pond changed over time and was becoming more saline. And again, while I can't necessarily trust the actual dates, the date ranges for these oysters, I can trust these groupings at least. So I dated this very young oyster that was attached to um, a human temporal bone at the time it was recovered. Um, and then I also dated this barnacle uh, that was going inside of the young oyster. So the oyster had to have formed first in order to provide a surface on which the barnacle could attach. And this is confirmed in the radiocarbon groups. So I'll finish up by tying all of the results from my various analytical tools into a more cohesive story. So we know the estimated ages of the oysters. We know the estimated seasons when they died. We know that there are two groups going on. Um, so based on all the data, oysters reveal two periods, um, separate time periods uh, and environments. And I'm interpreting these as inundation events. The first group seen here formed earlier in fresher water parameters. They were between 1.5 and three years old, which suggests the human remains and the modified wooden stakes were exposed for at least that long. Some of these oysters died in the winter and some of them died in the summer. The group two oysters formed second in an environment that was more saline. Um, they were between one and three years old, suggesting those human remains and modified stakes were exposed for that amount of time. They died during the summer and fall, which is the height of hurricane season in Florida. So interestingly, the context in which some of these oysters were found suggested a rapid burial event in which sediment capped the site and smothered the oysters and even preserved some of these pink proteins and also some organic material from those mudworms that were inside of the oysters, which is fascinating. So this type of situation would also obviously bury cultural material and aid in the preservation of that material. Even more interesting, the oysters that were attached to human remains at the time of recovery are in this second group. Um, you know, they likely remained attached to those human remains for so long because they were maybe quickly capped with sediment. Based on stable isotope analysis um, of the oysters, the pond was likely a somewhat isolated feature at the time that the oysters formed. The pond had to have been affected by evaporation and precipitation and groundwater sources, at least based on my oyster study. Um, I think these oysters formed prior to total marine transgression of the site, so prior to its existence in an offshore context. Sea level curves for this region suggest that the MKO pond would have been fully inundated by about 6,500 to 6,000 years ago. So um, I believe these oysters formed at some point prior to this. They formed on those exposed human remains and wooden stakes. And then a storm event at some point capped the site. And then as sea level continued to rise, the site became buried with modern marine sediments until it is now eroding out of the seafloor and we began our investigations um, in 2016. There were a couple of aspects that I did not get into, um, mostly in the interest of time, but I will leave you with this. What is amazing is that middle archaic period cultural material survived sea level rise, which is typically considered a very catastrophic process. MKO's existence suggests other similar sites may exist in these offshore contexts. So if people have been in Florida since at least 14,550 years ago, then this is a lot of terrain that people would have interacted with all those thousands of years ago. So we as archaeologists can learn a lot about past human behavior from these drowned sites that are typically out of sight and out of mind. Few people would expect human remains to survive 
thousands of years, let alone be exposed for a few years during oyster growth, and then yet still be around come 2016. My shell study is only one step in understanding this process of transgression and is the first time oyster shells attached to wooden stakes and human remains have been used to assess early sea level rise and timing of site inundation. But there's a lot more work to be done, um, including additional research into how this oyster data compares to um, sediment core and other geoarchaeological data. So again, we had like 28 sediment cores and tons of remote sensing data. So I'll, I'd be interested to see in the future how this this oyster uh, story compares to uh, the larger geoarchaeological story. Um, and then also additional research into why mortuary ponds were abandoned as a cultural practice uh, 5,800 years ago. Um, but if you want to read what I have to say about that, you'll have to look at my manuscript when I'm done with it. <laughs> In the meantime, um, I do want to give a shout out to these various groups for funding and um, other types of support. I would not have been able to conduct this study without it. Um, and then finally, if anybody, I know we'll have plenty of time for questions, but if anybody has um, any questions I don't get to today, or if anybody just wants to drop by and say hello, please do so. So I'm going to stop sharing in just a few seconds in case anybody wants to screenshot this email address. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Melissa. Very, very interesting talk. Um, yeah, so if anyone has any questions, feel free to type them in the chat. I think that's easiest. We already have some coming in. Um, so I can read them if that works for you, Melissa. Yeah, sure. That's fine. Okay. Uh, Rachel wants to know, she said, great talk. Could you talk a little more about why you think the oysters grew before full marine transgression? Was it due to salinity indicated by the isotopes? Also, was the site probably freshwater between the two groups of oyster growth? For the second one, I don't think it was freshwater between the two groups of oyster growth. Why I think it wasn't in a fully um, offshore or like full marine transgression is because there's variability in the profiles. So there was one study um, done on fully marine oysters versus like uh, estuarine oysters. And when you have these brackish or estuarine environments, you get a lot more variability in those profiles. And I'm getting variability in mine. Um, so I, I don't think it was fully transgressed by then. But I did do some modeling, um, which I didn't have time to talk about at this point. But based on the the water data. Basically, I built a model using a delta O18 to salinity uh, relationship equation. So I collected modern water samples and then um, wanted to build a relationship between that and equation to, to just remap the salinity of the past pond. Unfortunately, my water samples uh, were extra heavy, so I couldn't use them. But there is a paleo temperature equation that I use instead. So if you oysters cease growing at about 28 degrees Celsius because of heat stress. So if you use that 28 degrees Celsius um, marker in the paleo temperature equation, if you know the delta O18 in the shell and you know the 28 degrees, then it'll give you the estimated delta O18 of the water that the oyster was growing in. And so I, I use that equation to kind of guesstimate um, the past uh, salinity of the pond. Obviously there's a lot of confounding variables, but yeah, so I do not think it was fully transgressed. It had to have been affected by evaporation and precipitation and groundwater and also terrestrial decomposition. <laughs> You're welcome. All right, any other questions? I'll ask one while we're waiting. Um, <laughs> I told you no hard questions. No hard questions. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so you mentioned uh, the Polydora, the, the mudworms, mm. um, or Flacco, or not Flacco, mudworms. Um, I was wondering if you also saw evidence of sponges, because in Tampa Bay, modern oysters and archaeological oysters, I think I see more uh, sponge parasitism than uh, the, uh, the worms. So I was wondering if you saw that. Yeah, there were a few instances, and even in the the modern oysters that I collected, they were uh, affected by sponges. Yeah, so because I, I think saw they, that as well. I think they have slightly different salinity tolerances, so that might help you also narrow it down if some have based it. On, some don't. Yeah, based on the habitat and even the barnacles that were present, I was able to narrow narrow it down a little bit. So, yeah. Awesome. 
Oh, I was gonna say it has your name. <laughs> yeah, that's Bob. <laughs> With my name. Thanks, cool. Bob. Do we have any other questions? Just a lot of compliments. That's, that's okay. It. That's very sweet. Yeah. I'll have to finish up my manuscript and get it out there so that everyone can read uh, read about my uh, study. So Ooh. all right. So yeah, so um we have a question: what new technology has helped the scuba archaeologist? Hmm. Well, at BAR, we dive with full face masks. It's not really a new technology, but it's great because um, we can use communications while we're diving, which is awesome. So it's no longer just like a lot of hand signals. I can just be like, hey, can anybody pass me a pencil? You know, so it's really great to have um, to be able to communicate with people underwater, especially in the Gulf of Mexico. It can be pretty cloudy, so you can't really see as well. So I would say that one is great. And then the second one, it's not really related to scuba, but I had mentioned the parametric sub bottom profiler in those earlier slides. Um, that is an amazing remote sensing, a piece of remote sensing equipment that can basically build a 3D image of the buried deposit. So if you, you know, scan the site, you can then like manipulate it and see the whole thing in 3D on your computer screen, which is fascinating. So we were able to do that in um, 2019 through, um, yeah, cooperative agreements. So it was great. So I think that one's very important. <laughs> Not really scuba, but amazing nonetheless. Yeah, that's awesome. <clears throat> um, we have a question about, can you tell me a little about the human composition status? Hmm. I'm kind of confused as to the question. What do you mean? Claire, do you, can you reword it a bit? Composition. Hmm. Um, we can come back to that one. Okay. Um, For Bob how the site is being protected, I think Bob wrote that. So how is the site being protected? Um, we do have uh, marker buoys um, creating a buffer zone around the site. So this is all again through BAR, not Melissa's PhD candidate. Um, so there are marker buoys that create a buffer around the site and um, just pretty much asking the local community to keep an eye on the site and um, ask fossil hunters not to dive in the area. So we've done a lot of outreach down there. Um, Dr. Duggins has been great about outreach in the local community and then, you know, frequent patrols. And then we periodically go down and check on the site. And then, uh, yeah, I think that covers it. Awesome. And then we had another question about uh, the oyster drill and if you mm. saw evidence of that because they prefer higher salinities. You know, I did not, but we only excavated for one meter by one meter units. So my data is really biased. Um, I also wasn't like paying attention to oyster drills necessarily, but we do have a lot of bulk sediment that we need to go through. So um, we used a, an airlift. Um, and all of the sediment we capped. So we'll need to go through all of that. And there may be evidence there. I mean, there's certainly going to be more oysters in that sediment too, but I was dealing with a really small window of data. Uh, do we have any other questions? Last chance. And you can always email me if you think it's something. Thanks, Haley. <laughs> uh, so there's a question, is uh, there public archeology, span I guess, related to the site? Um, well, because of the sensitivity of the site with human remains, it can be a little, um, you know, it can be a little sensitive, but we have had a lot of volunteers come out. I mean, agency, countless agencies, we've had, uh, federal representation, um, people from NOAA and BOEM, we've had universities, um, even private sector, we had volunteers from the private sector come out. Um, yeah, so, and then again, a lot of outreach, um, continued presentations in the area, so, yeah. <laughs> 
And we have done tours for, um, like we had a lot of law enforcement involvement. So we took them to the site as well. And then the county, Sarasota County environmentalists helped us a lot, especially with putting in those marker buoys. So we were able to take them and they helped um, on the site a little bit too. So, yeah. Awesome. Okay, so Claire has- Oh, okay, I see. All right, so um, we just had human skeletal material and we did not do any destructive analysis at all. So um, this is a, a according to tribal requests and all of those remains have been repatriated. So there, there's no plans for any um, dating um, of human remains, so. And then uh, Pamela asked when the recording will be posted. I think I can take that one. Uh, probably within the next week. Live it up. <laughs> Awesome. Good questions. All right. Well, uh, no other questions are coming in. I think we can call it a night. And I just want to say thank you again, Melissa, for this great talk and uh, for sharing your research with us. Yeah. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Have a good one. Too. Thanks, everyone.